Check. Thank you so much. Hello. Test is working. Yes. Hey. Okay. Uh, I just sent I just sent the link to the participants to the online speakers. So. Huh? Ah. Uh, uh, yes. I'll share. Oops. Just a second. the name for you to see yeah Miguel so you find him Miguel um, just in case I'm gonna put find him very easily. Ready to start? Oh, I can start whenever. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, well, if you can help me with this slide, that would be great. Oops. <clears throat> That's it. Okay. Well, hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much for attending today's session. Uh, we're very excited to share uh, today's space with a very diverse group of individuals who are both online uh, and here with us uh, physically. So I'm very excited about this. But also we're very excited about um, sharing with an international audience uh, like the one IGF always offers. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Eduardo Carrillo and I am co-director of TEDIC, which is a digital rights organization based in the global south or the majority of the world, as it is more recently known, uh, particularly Paraguay. 
Um, so we have developed this part, this panel. Can you go to the next slide? I would really appreciate that. Um, we have developed this panel in partnership with Data Privacy Brazil and Privacy International, both organizations we admire very much and that we've been working on with for quite some time. You will hear from them very soon because we have speakers from both organizations. And I also want to acknowledge the presence of Marina, who is from Data Privacy, who is helping us with the online moderation. Um, now, going back to the matter in question uh, and, and, and the panel, Perils and Opportunities of Data Integration for Security, uh, in TEDIC, for the past 10 years, we have been working at the intersection of human rights and technology for quite some time. But one of the issues that we have been, or that have been, we have been quite interested in for, for some time now is the digitization of security policies particularly its effect on the rights to privacy, freedom of expression, and other associated human rights. Um, now, in this interest that we have as an organization, uh, there are three things that we have, or that have particularly caught our attention in the debate in question. Uh, the first one is the apparent understanding of the inescapable or, or unescapable trade-offs between security and privacy that is a common notion right now among public security organs across different countries. So, and this doesn't differ both uh, or in between global and uh, south countries. The second is the lack of capacities from states, and this one is specific to global south states, uh, in implementing or to implement complex digital systems. And this has a direct effect since it brings or it brings a new actor uh, to discussing the table, which is private sector companies, mainly from the global north, but also from other countries like China, who end up implementing such policies in our territories. Lastly, and this is particularly important because we are at an IGF, uh, the role and responsibility of international cooperation are very much often overlooked in global south context. Why? Because most of our countries are dependent and need this kind of help, so it's very difficult to negotiate international cooperation agreements and at the same time, for instance, contesting the kind of packages that come associated with, with those corporations and, for instance, implement or develop human rights impact assessments or data protection impact assessments. But this is also, or this also function backwards. Why? Because also international cooperation bodies don't necessarily and don't analyze the impact of digi digitization in security policies and they don't implement human rights impact assessment or they don't analyze the, the impact of a given help that they will give to a country from a human rights standpoint. Now, transversal to these three points that have caught our attention uh, as civil society organization, there are also structural realities that sort of like further complexize or, 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 or further make complex uh, the scenario that I am describing right now. First of all, um, the effective multi-stakeholder model at the national level and at the intersection of technology, security and digitization, but also in general is somewhat dead. And I'm really sorry, I don't want to sound uh, pessimistic, but this, let's say, uh, lack of effectiveness of the multi-stakeholder space as we speak further complicates that different voices can debate or generally evaluate the nuances of the trade-offs, for instance, of privacy and security, which are indeed very well-developed standards or well-developed processes in the human rights field, but also in the public admin literature. Second, most of the countries of the majority of the world lack adequate data protection frameworks that could somewhat limit the potential adverse effects uh, of mass surveillance systems and security programs in general. They are not sufficient, but they are a starting point, and we don't have that. And just to give an example, for instance, such effectiveness is reflected in laws that lack proper uh, application or effective reparation mechanisms in our territories, or even the lack of independent authorities uh, to enforce the law in the first place. Now, to reflect on all these matters that we believe are urgent and how we can establish networks moving forward, moving forward, because in the end, this is a workshop that intends to create a new space or sort of like exchange knowledge about different spaces that are existing right now that are discussing these issues. Uh, to ignite a multi-stakeholder collaboration on this topic from a rights-respecting point of view, we have a great group of individuals with us. Uh, so I'm gonna do a really quick overview of who they are and then we can go straight into the questions. The, the first one is Elena Secaf, uh, who is a researcher at Data Privacy Brazil, a civil society organization dedicated 
to the interface between the protection of personal data, technology, and fundamental rights, producing research and advocacy actions before the justice system, legislative bodies, and government. Juan de Brigar, who is here on my left, left, yeah, <laughs> uh, is the coordinator of Autonomy and Dignity at Fundación Carisma, which is a civil society organization that seeks to protect and promote human rights and social justice in the design and use of digital technologies. We have Eduardo Ferreira, who is also joining Like Elena online. So thank you so much to both of you because they are in Latin America, so it's very early uh, in the morning. Uh, I wouldn't even call it morning, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> is the project leader of ADC, which is a civil society organization based in Argentina that works to defend and promote civil and human rights in Argentina and Latin America. We have Dorothy Mukasa at my right, who is Chief Executive Officer of At Wanted Witness, an organization based in Uganda that seeks to create secure and censored online platforms for activists, netizens, bloggers, freelance journalists, and writers to promote human rights through writing and informing, educating the citizens and the citizenry who also utilize the platform for strengthening free expression and demand for accountability. Now, I'm about to finish, so bear with me, uh, but it's a good group. Uh, so we also have the pleasure of having Dr. Ilya Siatitsa, who leads one of the strategic areas of Privas International, a UK-based organization that works together with partners around the globe, challenge government and corporate exploitation of data and technologies. And lastly, and also thank you very much, Mr. Miguel Candia for joining online all the way from Paraguay. Uh, is a career diplomat from Paraguay, serving now as Director of Human Rights at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In the past 10 years, he served at the Paraguayan Mission to the UN in Geneva and as Director for Strategic um, Security of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He was also a United Nations IGF MAC member between 2017 and 2019 and a LAC IGF Program Committee uh, from 2000, 2019 to 2021. Now, just to give you an overview of what's going to happen next, uh, these panelists will bring different experiences across the security, privacy, and broader human rights landscape. So they're going to bring reflections from their territories on how the deployment of these digital technologies have affected their territories in different ways, and also what are the different nuances that should and must be considered by policymakers, the private sector, vendors, and also international cooperation when deploying or financing these kind of initiatives, since they directly impact people's lives. I mean, there's people uh, who are affected by these technologies, and it is also very important to consider that vulnerable communities, such as, such as socioeconomic disadvantaged groups or migrant communities, have a specific uh, disproportionate effect when dealing with these technologies. Um, so now, Ele, I don't know if you hear us. I hope you are. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I want to start with you a bit. Uh, if you can tell us a bit what is happening right now in the triple border area, which is an area, for those who don't know, is an area shared by Brazil, Argentina, and Paraguay. So it's a very sensitive area in terms of a lot of interest happening and a lot of geopolitical interest as well. So of course, there, are, there is a lot of public security debate on the, on, the, on the region and for the region. So Ele, what are the main trends happening right now regarding technology uh, right now in the area?
Thank you, Eli. Uh, eight, eight minutes and 51 seconds, so uh, we're okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that definitely I, I, I would like to highlight that the issue, uh, the, the difficulty of transparency uh, for researchers and the public in general in accessing these sort of uh, programs and what are the processes in place to implement them are quite a challenge uh, that needs to be uh, have in mind when d designing these kind of policies. What kind of transparency measures could be and should be in place, uh, although there is this narrative of security around the whole issue. Now, Juan, going from the very like mass surveillance uh, approach of, of the triple border area and the policy that Elena was uh, describing, I would like to hear a bit more about the Colombian landscape because you have an interesting, uh, well, a somewhat interesting um, <laughs> implementation of digital technologies to surveil specific groups. around mainly, we have a lot of Venezuelans coming into Colombia. Since uh, 2015, the border was closed for a while and then uh, it reopened and then there was a, a, a huge wave of migrants. We have the, the, the numbers for 2018, our official numbers at least, around 1,200,000 people uh, living in Colombia now. But of course, if you look to, to the press, the, the number could be at least twice as high or around two and a half million uh, Venezuelans moving into Colombia. That number is starting to decrease slowly, but it's uh, still uh, quite large. Um, and in that context, the former government on, of Colombia, who just uh, um, left office uh, this year, they launched a program called the Temporal Statute for Protection of the Venezuelan Migrants. And it's a program aimed at granting the migrants the possibility of working and, and being legally in Colombia to, to um, have a, a more uh, official way of yeah, re, uh, relating to the state. Uh, the, they, they issue a Temporal Protection Permit, PPT, by its Spanish acronym. Um, and then through that, uh, permit they can well access services and so on um, and that in, in order to acquire that permit uh, the migrants are required to complete a survey a unique registry for Venezuelan migrant survey and then that survey is uh, divided into three steps the first one is a pre-registry which usually takes place at the border, you cross the border and then you go to, to the migration office, you pre-register, they take some very rudimentary data of you, and then after that, you're, uh, you're missing two steps, which are a thorough, very, very thorough socioeconomical characterization survey and a biometric registry, which is also quite thorough. So before we go into the biometric registry, I want to talk talk about the second point, which is the characterization survey. Uh, this takes place once the migrants are already in Colombia and they have, to some extent, settled in, in the country. Of course, they, they do not yet have a permit to be there, but they already have some sort of a life there and they're not in the border, they're, they're already there. And in that uh, survey, they ask, really a lot of questions, a lot of, they ask for a lot of information. They ask about self-recognition and belonging, of course, whether you're um, asking for refugee status or not, 
they ask you for your former identity documents, and then that includes ethnic belonging and identity, and that includes sexual identity and sexual orientation, which is, or uh, gender identity and sexual orientation, which is, why would you need that? Uh, they ask about your family group, is the rest of your family planning to move here? Uh, they ask about your living conditions, whether you have access to subsidies, they ask whether you have children, children or teenagers that you're in charge of, they ask whether your children are enrolled in school. They ask about health, which is, uh, I mean, it would be all right to ask about health in general, but they ask about very specific conti conditions. Uh, contagious diseases, infections, uh, STDs, and which ones, whether you're in medication for STDs, whether you're pregnant, whether you're lactating. Um, they ask also for the motive of the, or the motivation for your migration. Uh, why did you decide to move, which is, can be very sensitive political information, of course. Uh, as well, they ask for your integration perception, whether you feel you're being um, well treated by, by the host country, and then they ask whether you have been subject to any form of violence in Colombia. And the reason why I'm going to this detail uh, in, the, in the survey is because all this information will be later on um, intertwined with the biometric data they're collecting as well, which is, I th in, in my eyes, a huge issue. So I'm gonna talk now about the, the use of biometrics in this context. Um, and there's four main conclusions I wanna draw from this. The first one is the fact that the state collects more data in the case of migrants than in the case of the Colombian population. The biometric registry of uh, Venezuelan population in Colombia includes, for instance, the measuring of the iris, which is not something we have in our national document of identity as Colombian citizens. So they're clearly using more biometrics for, for that sort of population. Um, the second one is the obvious experimental way in which the system is being deployed on this population. That the, the first reason to think it is experimental is the one I just gave, they're using more biometrics, but also the the next thing I want to talk about is the impossibility of migrant population to withhold consent. So it is experimental because they have a population which cannot withhold their consent uh, on, on giving that information and on, on uh, giving those data, those biometric data to, to the government. This is the reason I, I made such an emphasis on the fact that this population is already living in Colombia when they uh, complete the survey. It's not like they, they can just turn around and go back to Venezuela because they're in most cases seeking refugee status and even when they're not, they're at least fleeing some uh, very poor living conditions. So that's a huge issue and it's, it's proof that the, uh, the deployment of this is quite experimental. And the last thing I wanna think about in the, the, the context of biometrics is the fact that those biometrical data points are connected to the survey and the, the survey da data points. You could technically, uh, uh, how do you say, the, split the information into se two separate uh, categories in which one would be uh, identification and, and for that you need very little information. And then you have a statistical significance uh, measurement of whether people need certain um, services provided by the state. They're not doing that currently. They, they are still linking the information, the individual information to individuals via the biometrics. So there's no, no, not really a good justification for that as, as far as you can see. And um, to close, I wanna leave you with some uh, general questions. I don't have much time left, but I'll try to be brief. Um, the first one is about the, the narratives, the two conflicting narratives that the state has. They're, as in the same ca case of Elena, not necessarily explicit, but they are two conflicting narratives the government uh, gives for this. The first one is that they aim at granting security through surveillance with the biometric uh, identity and the biometric data. And the second one is that they, this, this ample data collection is aimed not at surveillance, but at granting rights to the population. And those narratives are, to some extent, competing with one another. Um, and now I get the feeling that the security narrative is 
gaining space in that in that discussion. Um, so, open questions for the panel: uh, Do we all need do 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 we need all these biometrical data for that purpose? Uh, what's the role of private companies? Uh, in the case of Colombia, the French company Idemia is the one that provides all the all the biometric technology. Uh, do we need them here? What's their role? Um, and then, is this feasible as a security strategy? I'm not quite convinced, but I guess we'll have a chat about that now. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Juan. Idemia, that old friend. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, okay, well, I'm, uh, in interest of time, uh, you gave great points, but I'm going to move to Eduardo. Eduardo is joining us from Argentina, from a civil society organization called ADC. Uh, Eduardo, there has been an interesting debate in, in Argentina around uh, the legality of facial recognition technologies and facial recognition cameras in particular in certain public spaces in Argentina. And in those debates, there is currently a court ruling that has... Uh, ignite quite a debate internationally internationally because it has banned these technologies uh, in certain spaces. So did security did public security play a role in this discussion and, and, and could you give us a snapshot on the on the situation? Thank you Edu and thank you for the invitation to be part of this uh, panel and thank you all of you for, for attending this, this session. Well my name is uh, Eduardo Ferreira I'm Project Leader at Asociación por los Derechos Civiles, Association for Civil Rights, which is an NGO based in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and is also from the global majority. In, in my presentation, I want to talk about two things. The first one will be the research that IDC uh, is conducting about the landscape of surveillance technology operating in Argentina. Um, and the second one is, is going to be about uh, facial recognition, uh, particularly. Um, ADC has, has been researching this um, the, the, the array of surveillance technology that is operating in Argentina for a long year, uh, for many, many years. Um, based on our experience in, in the country, there are several obstacles that civil society organizations face when researching surveillance technologies. Um, the first one uh, is the lack of information and transparency. It was really hard for us to see the whole picture of the surveillance technologies deployed in Argentina because this, is, this information is not available through public channels. Uh, we try to obtain information in, in official websites on state purchasing, but neither national nor local governments provided any kind of information about their agreements with uh, technology providers. Then we tried to submit FOIA requests, but most of them were never answered by the government. And in those cases that we do receive a response, the information provided was uh, very insufficient. And this, and it was that despite the fact that Argentina has uh, an access to information law that it was passed like four years ago, it was a very modern law. But public safety or national interest are, or interest reason are often cited by, by government as justification for refusing to provide uh, information. Um, litigation is not a workable option, uh, since the judicial process in Argentina takes too much time to help us get the information that we need for, for our work. With respect to private company, the situation was very similar. We tried to reach out to them via email, uh, via LinkedIn, but in the vast majority of cases, uh, we were not able to establish direct communication with company representatives. And one additional obstacle is that surveillance technology in Argentina are acquired through local suppliers and not directly from the manufacturers. This is another way for surveillance companies uh, to remain in the dark and avoid public scrutiny, in addition to ignoring inquiries and failing to be communicative and transparent. Considering this scenario, we, we had to rely on alternative strategies. We look at official statements made by public authorities and company representatives. For instance, some of these technologies were publicly launched by governments and we use those opportunities to obtain information. Companies' websites were also a useful tool. We noticed that companies use the deployment of this technology as marketing case studies. And in this way, we can get a glimpse of their relationship with the public sector. Media reports and research by independent journalists are also a very important source of information for us. 
they help us to shed light on the public private partnership involved in surveillance deployment and the poor human record of these surveillance companies around the world. However, it's worth highlighting that most mainstream media outlets in Argentina usually uncritically portray these tools as the solution to violence and crime. <clears throat> Our experience researching surveillance and technologies has left us a number of lessons. Some of them are, it is important to create coalition with other CSOs. Public official and private companies representatives are very reluctant to provide information. Therefore, it's key for organizations working on surveillance technology to be in touch with each other in order to obtain information, share contacts, or distribute research uh, data. Second lesson is to work more closely with like-minded journalists and the media. Journalist research can be a, a very great asset in shedding light on the agreement between companies and government. Journalists also can play a key role in creating awareness and debate by changing the narrative about surveillance tech. And the last one is try to engage international actors in what's happening in your country due to public image worries, national governments, or at least they the case in Argentina, are more likely to pay attention to certain concerns when they are voiced by international human rights organizations or international human rights bodies uh, or global actors um, rather than national ones only. Uh, so it, it, it was very important for us to, 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 to create coalition, to create alliances with these external actors. That's the, the first part of my presentation. Then going back to specifically the situation in, in Argentina, uh, a, research, a research showed that surveillance cameras with facial recognition software are the most widely used technology in Argentina. These systems are being implemented with the goal of detecting people accused of committing crimes. Maybe the most relevant case in the facial recognition system is the, the system deployed in the city of Buenos Aires. Buenos Aires is the capital of Argentina. Um, this system is deployed in the subway station in, and it started in 2019. Um, Buenos Aires transit system is just about 1.5 million people every day. And as soon as it started to work, there were many cases of false positive. People wrongly uh, detained by the police because they saw that this, the person was uh, uh, a fugitive. Um, and the government were called out by international human rights organizations such as Human Rights Watch for using the system to track children wanted for uh, alleged uh, crimes. Facial um, recognition systems are also deployed in other cities of Argentina, like Mendoza, Tigre, Cordoba. So this is like a growing trend in, in, in my country to use the, that kind of system. Um, faced with that scenario, civil society organizations uh, had to rely on different strategies to contest that. Uh, one of them was litigation. My organization started a, a litigation against the government of the state of Buenos Aires to challenge uh, to constitutionally challenge the the, the facial recognition system and also there were another uh, uh, lawsuits submitted by other uh, organizations by other colleagues for us and all of this ended up in in the justice of one side declaring that the system and uh, deploying the capital city was unconstitutional because it was mass surveillance and it was affecting the right to to privacy and this judicial ruling was appealed by the by the national government, by the city of government, uh, by the Buenos Aires government, sorry. And we are also pending of the ruling by the Supreme Court. Anyway, uh, no matter what happened with the final result, and we think that this is a very good step in challenging this kind of system because it helped to raise awareness in Argentina and it helped to expose how these uh, systems are not only used to prevent crime, but also are being used to surveil the whole population in, 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 in Argentina. Another strategy that we have to rely on is to, like I said before, engage in human rights uh, international bodies. For instance, in 2019, the former United Nations rapporteur on the right to privacy, John Canatache, visited Argentina. Uh, we met with, with him and expressed our concerns about uh, the situation of the right to privacy in, in my country. Then he met with public officials from the national government or from local governments. And then he published a, a, a statement uh, in which he said that the public official from the city of Buenos Aires couldn't justify the necessity or the proportionality of the facial recognition system deployed in Buenos Aires. Uh, and this was because they haven't conducted any human rights and on data privacy impact assessment on, on the topic. No? 
So that way they, they, they couldn't explain the, the, the rapporteur on why this system is needed in, 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 in Argentina or in Buenos Aires to, uh, to perform security function. No? So one of the things that one of the lessons that we we get from that is that it's important to push for from this kind of evaluation, this kind of assessment, because it has to, it forces government to be more transparent and more honest about uh, the technology deployed and also in what they are doing, the things that they are doing. Um, I, I will stop here because I know we have another round of, 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 of a comment and question, um, but just to, to, to briefly summarize uh, my, my intervention is um, face the system has to be contested by many uh, strategies, advocacy, research and litigation, and they are tools that we can use them and we can share with other organizations and other experience in other countries because fighting this implementation of this system is very difficult considering what Edu has said. People and the media and the mainstream media tend to be these, these tools as a solution to crime, not as a tool that affects human rights. And I will stop here and I pass the floor to, to Edu. Thank you. You've raised a lot of interesting points, particularly the transparency one. Again, it's a common thread. And I'm also glad that you have mentioned the public-private partnership nature of these sort of programs, because it's something that Ilya, in a way, might touch upon. Um, so we've been so far very focused uh, on the Latin American region. Most of the panelists are from Latin America, so there is a bias there. Uh, <laughs> but we are very happy to have Dorothy Mukasa uh, from Unwanted Witness. Uh, to give us a bit about the uh, uh, flavor, in a way, of what's happening uh, in in Uganda in particular. Um, so what is the current landscape in Kampala in the matter uh, regarding surveillance technologies in general? Like, what are the actors who are playing a role there? Uh, can you give us a brief overview of this? Thank you so much. Uh, taking a break from the Latin American perspective. Um, but I want to plug it, plug in uh, what uh, the question that was raised and the role of uh, telecom uh, technology companies, but also add uh, what the role of international uh, bodies should be in terms of supporting uh, the application of technology in uh, promotion of human rights. I want to say that in Africa, we do not produce these technologies. Definitely, uh, te these technologies are imported into Africa. Okay, and that brings in a critical role of uh, the international body, you know, uh, in terms of regulating how these technologies are imported into Africa. Uh, in all um, in all scenarios, you see that uh, you know there is a rush for African countries to adopt these technologies, uh, but we also know that, uh, like, uh, as it has been mentioned by Elena, that. Uh, Security use of technology is not the the end to uh, super having super security in our in our countries. So we need to question why these technologies are imported, and this I think the African uh, African authorities are not able to question that because they are rushing for these technologies with hope that they are going to be to secure their their countries. So this this is this is why the role of international communities is very important. You know to question and put uh, measures that really, um, you know, limit the abuse that we are continuously seeing. Uh, as, as unwanted witness, we've studied uh, the, uh, the smart city, we all know the smart city uh, projects that are being undertaken in different parts of Africa. Uh, and Uganda is part of that smart city project where we're seeing China, you know, uh, you know, importing technologies in these countries uh, with a hope that we'll be able to, governments are able to really uh, curb crime, you know, but we've also seen abuses of these technologies in return, where we are seeing uh, a lot of shrinking civic space uh, with the use of these technologies, clamping down on, on journalistic work, uh, activist work, but also, uh, you know, targeting different political actors with th these uh, these technologies in this in these places, you know, but there's also a question of investment. You know, we're seeing a lot of investment in these technologies uh, at the expense of uh, the citizens' welfare. You know, 
We have ailing uh, healthcare assistants, uh, people are, are strapped in poverty, but then uh, the priority of our governments are focusing on um, uh, investing in technologies, you know, in, 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 in a way of securing our citizens. We're also seeing in places where you have data protection laws, for example, in Uganda, you have a data protection law, but then there are exemptions when it comes to national security that are collected for national security. I think this, that gives a leeway for governments to collect as much data as they can. Shru, shru, I mean, um, co being covered into uh, national security causes, okay? And this is the case with the CCTV systems in, in Uganda. So far, we've invested over $200 million uh, for, uh, in, in, the in, in the CCTV uh, system project. You know? But if you, you look at, um, assess the, 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 the value for money, you know, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the, 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 the importance of the technology, you know, the, there's a lot of, a, a big gap, you know. But also uh, we've seen uh, these cameras work so hard, so being applied uh, during uh, electoral processes, you know, trying to limit civic space again, uh, where you know the opposition is not given an opportunity to assemble simply because you know uh, that divergent view is not uh, favorable to, um, to to the powers that are, that's, that 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 um, that th that are uh, in place right now. I in West Africa, for instance, uh, we are seeing the French uh, security firm, you know, developing similar systems of mass biometric uh, surveillance, you know, um, aided to stop uh, immigration, but also facilitate the deportation of, of different groups. And this is a threat, you know? Uh, and oftentimes these systems are not really, um, uh, and, and uh, th there's no uh, human rights impact assessment that's being done prior to the uh, to the deployment of these systems. Just like uh, what I've had in, in 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 Latin America, you know, these systems are just deployed uh, across board without uh, any due uh, any due processes processes that are being done. Uh, again, in uh, 2019, you know, Uganda also uh, uh, partnered with uh, Gamalto, which is a French company to deploy autom automated biometrics uh, identification systems uh, that is being used at borders, but also live scanners, uh, scan technologies that are being deployed still at the borders. And these, these have been used, we've oftentimes uh, had uh, um, critical voices uh, in videos that try to come into the country being deported simply because they're critical uh, voices that speak around issues of human rights. Uh, in the country. Again, uh, these systems, like uh, previous speakers have said, are deployed in a lot of secrecy, you know? Uh, both procurement and deployment is always done in secrecy. Uh, in the research that we did around CCTV systems, we realized that parliament, which is an oversight body, uh, was oftentimes is not involved. They don't even know uh, the companies that are, have given have been awarded the tenders. They do not know how much money is, is spent on these systems simply because uh, the, 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 the requests to parliament are presented as uh, classified expenditures. And these classified expenditures are not questionable and they're not interrogated by parliament. So that power is withdrawn and uh, you know, taken over by the security agencies that procure uh, these systems. So uh, it also goes back to the lack of transparency, you know, when it comes um, uh, to to these technologies. Um, there's a rush also from uh, talk from private companies that are, are marketing these these uh, these technologies to companies, often uh, rather to to governments. Oftentimes, it's these companies that reach out to our governments, you know, uh, with proposals of uh, great security to 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 their to, to to their citizens, but also great to empower them to be able to to be to acquire more power and control over over citizens. Okay, uh, 
we have a Russian company uh, that has of recent uh, presented its proposal to be able to provide automated uh, uh, number plates to, uh, to, uh, to the government so that government is able to trace, you know, monitor who, uh, citizens through, uh, the, the monitor their mobility within the country, but also across, across the country. So this is where I think we need to question the involvement of um, private companies in the provision of security, uh, security te technologies that are, are supposed to, be to provide security in our, in our jurisdictions. Uh, so uh, it's important uh, that, uh, um, that uh, the multi-stakeholder approach is taken in terms of uh, pushing back uh, on the way how these technologies are procured, but also how these technologies are deployed in, in our own jurisdictions. Thank you. Uh, time's up. Thank you so much, Dorothy. I think the two things that are very interesting of what Dorothy, Dorothy brought are, first of all, that even though in places where data protection laws are in place, they are not necessarily sufficient because they clash with the national security narrative, and it's a balance that still needs to be uh, discussed. And then the other one is the market share interest and the revenue of these companies that have a huge interest in deploying system across the world. And I think that so far with the four, like, four examples that we have seen, we pretty much seen that they are the same technologies used over and over again in different contexts and exported for different reasons, but with the same methodology. So uh, in that tone and going from global, from local to global, uh, we have Ilya Satitsa from Privacy International, uh, who has been working a lot in issues of um, public-private partnerships and also uh, tracking companies in general and, 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 and the export of these technologies. So, from a global perspective, what are these trends uh, regarding surveillance technologies and the export of these technologies uh, that perhaps PI is identifying? Uh, what can you share about this with us? Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be uh, joining the conversation today. It has been really, I, I've been taking notes. So I've been great to see also how everything uh, is coming together, as you said. And um, I'll stick uh, to the African continent just to keep the balance of <laughs> how it's the same trends all around. And also, uh, I will start by bringing an additional driver of this surveillance. Uh, Dorothy, you mentioned the question of movement of private companies. So it's a question who pays as well for these private companies to be joining. Uh, and it was also mentioned in Colombia and the Chippewa border about who funds this project and the involvement of third countries in all that. And uh, let me share you a few examples of experts of surveillance from the continent we meet. So the U.S. National Security Agency has provided Ethiopia with technology and training, enhancing the country's surveillance capabilities in exchange for local knowledge and the advantageous location. A number of Chinese companies with close ties to the Chinese government, such as Huawei and Cloudwalk, beyond uh, Uganda, what's already uh, mentioned, we have also uh, reports uh, that they supply the Zimbabwean government with surveillance technologies. And finally, the EU uh, has funded a 28 million um, euro program aiming to develop a universal ID system in Senegal as part of its migration management policy. Um, these are a few examples of how countries with the largest defense and security sectors are transferring technology and practices to governments and agencies around the globe. And this is something that I think comes out very strongly out of this conversation. Um, Privacy International's research on transfers of surveillance from the US, EU, but also international organizations, including the UN, has brought to light the policy agendas which underpin these huge investments being made in uh, security agency, uh, security capabilities in countries. Uh, funding uh, from these bodies can take various forms from direct equipping or training of security agencies to financing of their operations and procurement 
to facilitating exports of surveillance technologies by specific companies, which brings it back, and promoting legislation that actually enables surveillance and doesn't pay due regard to the human rights protections that need to be in place when, uh, in, when, uh, when using such technologies. And it has been already mentioned, there isn't much more to say. Uh, but what's the problem with actually driving this surveillance equipment? Because we know very little about it. What tools do they have? Where are they coming from? What legislation is, um, is, is regulating them? And do we even need them? Is that the priority we should be having? And this is a key point because with many of these cases, they are actually facilitating not what they claim to do, but actually arbitrary power, they tear apart communities, and they ultimately even also close down spaces where we can live free from fear and repression. And we've heard already about the different narratives that are used, securitization being the primary one, uh, different narratives of securitization, to be honest, about how these are implemented and bringing it back to the EU migration policy, which for, to me sounded, when I first saw it, I was like, okay, that's a new way of extending the way we see security. But basically the EU has been pursuing a clear policy of border externalization. So how can they push people from not reaching the physical borders of the EU or the EU space and doing the controls before that in the countries uh, the, the countries the migrants could be coming from. And they are doing that by equipping non-member states with surveillance capabilities to prevent migration to Europe. And this is uh, particularly exemplified by the EU Trust Fund for Africa for stability in addressing root causes of irregular migration and displaced persons in Africa. And while it does, of course, fund development projects like water sanitation, uh, which is an important aspect, and it also equips and trains security agencies to enhance surveillance capabilities. I already mentioned Senegal being one example. Cote d'Ivoire has a similar system, but also there is an 11 million and a half million project uh, that uh, is funding IMSI catchers, which is an advanced mobile surveillance tool, surveillance drones, cameras, surveillance software, and telecommunications wiretapping center in Niger's border. And there are so many others. The, the fund has a half a billion budget. Um, and what the implementation of this project conveniently does is it also, also influences the, the development of legislation which criminalizes movement across borders and hardens porous borders. It also awards lucrative contracts to companies, it was already mentioned, and often well-connected European uh, security companies. And it inevitably will influence, and it will be felt for decades, vast of millions of people. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, while the European Commission has been funding these projects and will continue to do with a new uh, fund uh, that where EUTF is going to be integrated to, uh, they have been paying very little due regard to actually doing human rights impact assessments, including data protection impact assessments, before making those transfers. And uh, our research has shown through freedom of information records and document uh, reviews has shown a complete lack of any such impact assessments. And uh, so fresh from the press, um, and not yet on the press, um, the European Ombudsman, which is the monitoring body of the EU institution's compliance with human rights, um, uh, this week agreed with us uh, and issued a decision concluding that the European Commission was not able to demonstrate that the measures in place ensured a coherent and structured approach to assessing the human rights impacts of the European Trust Fund for Africa projects and recommended that they introduce impact assessments into the transfers. Bringing it back to public private, private partnerships through a major leap in a way, but not. I mean, it comes the golden questions. What can we do about it? What can we do all together? 
and there are multi multiple challenges in that work from lack of transparency, profit interests, um, lack of legal frameworks, uh, and the multiple actors that are involved in the process from the funders to the companies, to the national governments, to the people that are affected, to the civil society, just uh, to name a few. And yet there are many strategies one can follow. One was the, what I described about targeting the funders of surveillance and pushing them to ensure protections are in place before making the transfers to actually targeting the, 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 the companies that they are involved. And one way to do that as well is by actually uh, pushing for the introduction of proper legislation around public-private partnerships. This includes basically a company, any kind of company-government collaboration that um, uh, aims where the government is outsourcing some part of their surveillance um, uh, powers and they are increasingly depending on these companies to conduct to, to this surveillance, which is ultimately the prerogative of the state and not of the private sector. Thank you. With very little then to say just um, Privacy International, with the experience we have gathered, but also the support and input from our partners and their experiences, including ADC and others, we have developed a handbook for civil society uh, to help challenge these partnerships and to assist with understanding, multi-level understanding of tech, the law and the government mechanism that they are involved in order to be able to push nationally and internationally for stronger re regulation of, this, uh, of these relationships. Thank you very much. We look forward for reading that report uh, as well. Um, so just to give a bit of context, we are one presentation away to finish this first part, and then we have planned 15 minutes for actual engagement. And we have some igniting questions to hear your feedback about, because m much of the conversation right now has been very much concentrated in what are the different avenues that civil society can take in order to contest or in order to better understand how this system works. But we actually want to push it forward towards an agenda that also, or that also includes other actors who are doing this type of work and who are interested in collaborating in different ways. Um, so Miguel, I hope you're hearing us well. Uh, thank you so much for joining from Paraguay. Uh, Miguel, as I said, is from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Paraguay, and he's sort of like bringing also the government uh, or a government sensitivity in the matter. Uh, so, Miguel, can you tell us a bit like from a statesman's perspective or, or point of view, how do you illustrate the process by which these technologies arrive in the country? How does the country deal uh, when implementing these technologies and what are like minimum safeguards that could be put in place um, when dealing with them? Hi, well, thank you very much for having me on, on the panel and, and good morning, everybody. I am um, happy, actually, that, that if in my, um, it was my time to talk after all of you because I got to, I got to hear every, everyone's opinion first and then I can react to that. I had, you know, uh, some, some information that I wanted to share with you, but uh, being able to to listen to every to every experience you have, I'm gonna change a little bit the the way I was going to approach this uh, this panel, and um, I'm gonna be a bit of a distorting voice because uh, I have to tell you things from the state's per perspective, and that is uh, always complicated. Um, but I'm happy that I have uh, not not only Eduardo from Chile Society over there, but also one of my House representatives, so I cannot lie in any way. <laughs> and exercising my diplomatic nature, I would say that I'm pretty much in agreement with everything you said so far, every single panelist. And uh, I'm going to try and give you uh, a few pointers on uh, on the general situation of the of the globe of the globe of every single nation state in the way we try to approach of course is um, every country is different and and we have uh, scales and, and 
powers that are in place. But one, one first element that uh, from the state position is, uh, is necessary to take into account that probably is, is not usually deeply taken on from any other perspective is the, the sovereign issue. Sovereignty for us is the first and foremost uh, goal, deal, and, and nature of the presence of the state in any, in any scenario. So whatever we do, it has to be with, uh, with, uh, in, within a sovereign capacity and with a sovereign uh, security taken uh, uh, standpoint. So for us, it's, it's very, um, it's an element that is uh, embedded in, in the nature of what we do. And it takes us to why we need technologies. And, and, and for states, Technologies are uh, uh, just, but also uh, a tool. And in this case, they are not an end goal. You know, this is not the end game. The end game is to provide the services that we are there for. So technologies in this case, it doesn't exactly equal efficiency, but they need to uh, provide. And within that scenario you have different uh, different needs from states so you have if you're if you're a, a region like the eu or or a power like the us or russia or china you have a different point of view uh, on security but uh, in our case uh, as a state in in Paraguay in particular in this case we need to solve some issues uh, with, with technology uh, and that is one of them is, for example, the, the insecurity sense of the populations. Uh, and in order to provide better security, you need uh, ICTs and ICTs as, as a, an element of engaging properly the, the policies in place. That is not always easy. And, and because of the, of the state of the world that we are fully connected in any case, Paraguay, for example, has around 97% of uh, mobile internet access. So pretty much every Paraguayan is connected and every Paraguayan is at the same time vulnerable to, to ICT, ICT misuse from the state or any other actor. And this engages us uh, with uh, the issue of security versus human rights. And I, I'm using this uh, phrase like on purpose. There is no versus issue, of course, uh, every state, you know, either more or less, are engaged in human rights. You know, in the case of Paraguay, we are members of pretty much every single instrument in the international system, in the, in the international human rights system, both inter-American and universal. So for us, the the implementation of the law, it's uh, it comes with the human rights uh, duty, and states. From aside from other actors, are bounded by um, due, due process. So when I hear the, the the words about due process in implementation of ICTs, first I fully agree, and second I have to remind uh, all panelists and, and everyone listening that states are the, the first one bound by due process. Other because, for example, if the uh, the military, the security segments, the the executive branch uh, does an administrative investigation or a judicial investigation and not comply with the, with the human rights um, obligations of the country, it will be taken down by uh, the defense uh, lawyers or the, the, even the, the, the judiciary branch. So everything you do will not give you the service and will not give you the result if you don't follow the process. This is the case um, everywhere. It, it depends on, on how the, the state is structured, but it is pretty much the case everywhere. And, and then you have an economy in what we see as defense. Defense for us, for states, is a state-to-state -state issue. It's different from the fight against crime or organized crime in particular, that is multinational. Uh, those, that is, as a national security issue, but it's still an international security issue as well. So there you have the differences between states. 
you have uh, a sovereignty issue again and then you have a co international cooperation issue on security and against organized crime there you have different uh, uh, foreign policies different technologies that are not interoperable, interoperable between them uh, lack of um, confidence trust building uh, measures within the militaries and among different militaries from different countries. Uh, there are federal countries and military countries that uh, take into account different points of view in, in, on how to deploy the defense and anti-organized uh, crime issues. And uh, that take us, like, very, I'm, I'm doing this very quickly, but that takes us to the issue of transparency. That was another uh, thing that was um, in everybody's uh, presentation and transparency is a, it's a it's a difficult issue when you when you put it aside or in in, uh, in the same in, in parallel ways with uh, with security you know even in in the international system in the international human rights systems you have uh, conflicting articles of uh, privacy and and uh, and access, you know, and those again taking into account the needs of being able to fight organized crime that is very well uh, equipped with ICTs makes it really really hard to be open and transparent because you're already giving giving your your advantage on on the strategic field, and that of course has an effect an effect on the citizenship on the on the on the human rights of people and particularly when you have to talk about organized crime you you talk about migration and you talk about uh, human mobility these issues uh, are well connected are, are in, and they are taken within the states from from different institutions and this is quite a, an issue because uh, normally we have to tend no that's all right uh, one minute is uh, i think more than i need no, but i wanted to close by saying this we have to uh, we, we take a statement a states as a whole and with a hive mind and that is not usually the the reality uh, states within in the case of paraguay that it's uh, for certain uh, the states actually challenge themselves uh, different branches and different powers and different institutions uh, look to each other and uh, sometimes uh, challenge each other and sometimes blame each other for, for, for different things and uh, we you can see different politics and different views with, from within governments and from within states so this has an effect on how you implement both policies and ICTs uh, in itself so I just wanted to, to leave you guys with that this is our uh, the, the complexity of, of, the, of how states have to uh, deploy the, the guarantees of the rights of the people that uh, we have to protect in every single way. But uh, due process is first, human rights are first, and from that we can, we can build on. That's all for me now, Eduardo. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, where the actual discussion uh, with the participants uh, hopefully will happen. So I don't know if the if you guys can help me again to put the slides with the question. Um, I think that two things that resonate a lot with me with what Miguel just said is, first of all, uh, the issue, I mean, I think that in a way is very uh, reassuring the importance of, the, of sovereignty. And of course, states value that. But at the same time, this issue that he was mentioning about the, the state not being a whole and being different institutions implementing different policies could potentially have an effect in how sovereignty is understood and then that acquires a new nuance when you talk about implementation of digital technologies where normally there isn't much of a connection between sovereignty and technology and i think that for instance could be an interesting value of creating multi-stakeholder processes that can help those governments uh offices to deal with those um with those nuances and help them identify them so basically we just want to open the floor. We're so glad that uh, we have so many people participating both on online and also here uh, on the floor. Uh, some initial questions that uh, we decided to put to sort of like 
sort of like uh, started the, the discussion was, suppose digital technologies were to be deployed in the context of security, border and public security, can we identify and agree upon the minimum safeguard and processes that should be in place for these technologies not to undermine fundamental rights? Or for instance, what are the best practices or processes we can potentially start to strengthen uh, for networking spaces to exist between civil society and academics from the, from the global south with policymakers and international cooperation that work uh, at the intersection of the issues we have discussed? And lastly, and more from an oper operational standpoint, I guess, what direct communication channels we could uh, start thinking of for, for, for discussing these issues. So uh, again, thank you so much for everyone joining. And I think that now is just an issue of, of, of hearing. Uh, what are your thoughts? Perhaps if you, uh, if you have other experience to share, that could also be very interesting to, to, to hear. Oh, and also I forgot, uh, if you can please identify yourself, that way we can do a follow-up, uh, if that's possible, of course. Good, good morning, everyone. My name is Ndiaga. I'm from Senegal, a French-speaking country. So I'm going to speak French. <laughs> can I? I'm a bit limited in my French, you, but if someone about else human is... Right, okay. inclusion. You're talking about human rights and inclusion. We are excluded if you don't speak English. All right, let me try to speak English. No, 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 speak French. No, that's uh, fine. Can, yeah, that, that's fine. Let, let me try to speak English. Let me try to speak English. I think that when it comes to security and data protection, we will never have neither security no data protection, as long as we keep using technology built elsewhere with other needs, most likely different from our need. And we have to learn from American position about West, uh, foreign technology. America does not want to see five Chinese 5G technology. Why? TikTok has been banned from America. Why? Because they don't. <coughs> because they don't want what they used to do to other people, spying on them using technology. Chinese do the same to them. Unfortunately, we are in a world where algorithms are more powerful, more powerful than legal protection. So why in Africa they? want to make us believe that if we have a strong data protection act and a powerful data protection authority we can be protected against risk of digital technology no way technology has to be built from the ground up no shortcut no leapfrog and to do that we need a strong political will and we don't have it in africa because most of our country we have authoritarian regime. They don't care about human rights or security. The only thing they care about how to stay on power. So whatever technology you sell them, they're gonna buy it as long as it is, it's gonna allow them to further the control on their own people to stay on power. And among those countries that moving from democracy to authoritarian regime, we have Senegal, Ivory Coast and Benin. And they buy anything about security. And in front of that situation, we have a weak civil society that lack human resources and financial resources. But the biggest obstacle of human rights in this context is access to information. In Senegal, you don't have a law on access to information. The government doesn't public anything about surveillance capability and technology. Nothing. And unfortunately, we don't have a cooperation, collaboration between international human rights organizations and like Privacy International, Access International, and local organizations. We are not aware of any collaboration between Privacy International and local organizations in the Francophone area. Access now, they show up only when something bad happens in a country like internet shutdown. Otherwise, you don't see them. Amnesty International, 
Human Rights Watch, Article 19, they don't work with local organization in Africa, especially in the Francophone area. So this civil society has no way to advocate for human rights and transparency. So what we need now is to have a strong collaboration between these international organizations where they have accountable, accountable government that cooperate with local organizations in order for them to get information to advocate for more human rights in Africa. Thank you. Uh, thanks for this uh, panel. It's been really a fascinating conversation. Um, I have so many things on my mind right now. Um, but Could you um, identify yourself? Oh, yes. Um, my name is Shabnam Mojtahedi. I'm with the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law, ICNL. Um, so uh, just I, I really appreciated the perspective from uh, uh, Miguel, I think the official from Paraguay. Um, and uh, I just wanted to s reflect that like the privacy rights issue, I, I, it needs to be seen hand in hand with the, with the, with the human security issue. If you don't, uh, if you, if you, if you exclude privacy rights from that, then you don't have full uh, human security. Uh, that's just my perspective on that. Um, and then the problem with uh, lack of transparency is that, yes, due process, I, I believe Paraguay and many other countries are, are valuing due process, but a l because of the lack of transparency, it's impossible to know when the rights are even being violated, right? And so a lot of these surveillance tech are being used without even, um, uh, with no intent to ever bring it to trial, like without without any intent intent with uh, uh, using it as evidence in court, so it's never going to be challenged on those grounds, especially especially in the migration issues that were discussed um, by a couple panelists. Um, those are just used uh, uh, for the securitization of, of of the environment, not not for uh, evidence in trial. So then, how are you able to challenge that through defense lawyers or or, or the judici judiciary, as was mentioned? Um, and then my, my questions are um, with uh, Ilya. Um, I think you, you kind of brought to light one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is just this, this whole ecosystem that feels very overwhelming uh, to deal with. And I think you, you touched on uh, NSA, uh, EU, uh, Chinese corporations, uh, but there's also uh, FATF, the
mitigate some of the risk uh, towards us. Another and we'll be fighting together towards another goal uh, and uh, I mean I, I'll only cannot speak on behalf of the entire international community but I have uh, when we did the research on Senegalese ID system this has been uh, we have tried to reach out to civil society and haven't been able uh, and we also did freedom information requests, but that you're absolutely right, did not work. Um, so it would be great to continue this conversation after this panel and to hear more about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. No, you can, you can keep it. Do you want to say something about the procurement uh, oh. that was mentioned? Oh, yes. Um, keep it. We are on, on time, but I think we can stretch it for two or three more minutes. So let me do it quick. Um, Oh yes, I think there's there's need for reform uh, to reform these laws, but also uh, these laws, traditional laws that are available, can provide some basics. For instance, uh, provision of who is providing that technology, the bidding process, you know, provides transparency in the, in the bidding process. But I think these are intentionally evaded by uh, governments to be able to uh, to operate in secrecy. We've not seen in processes where these basics have been followed, uh, even where they exist. But I think there's also import, it's, it's also important to, to do some reforms to reflect the technological nature of these uh, 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 procurement processes. Yes. Thank you, yes. I, I had a couple reactions, mainly to, to the Miguel's intervention, which I think was very enriching. Um, and the first thing I wanted to talk about was sovereignty, the issue of sovereignty, which I think is quite at the center of this. Um, thinking about it, I think you can uh, come at it from a very classical perspective and understand sovereignty as mainly as a thing that has to do with security. And I'm thinking, of course, of the issue of borders. But uh, in our context, I think the, the fact that we're depending so much on foreign technology is in itself also a question of sovereignty. So those things cannot be at stake. It, 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 one has to take into consideration the fact that that also has to be dealt with to some extent. So it, that's very obvious in Colombia. We have also biometric systems for elections and so on. And that it's a real question of whether we're in charge of our own democracy or not. Um, so, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't go too deep on that argument from the from the uh, state's perspective, perhaps. Um, the second thing I wanted to talk about is the, this very enriching idea of the, the that the state is not a hive mind and it's not uh, a, a closed unit. Um, but I think if you don't think of the st state that way, the stakes are even higher for technology and for um, data recollection because. If we think of the state as something which has many parts and it's shifting and moving, uh, there's a chance that that information or that technology can be misused as is in Africa by somebody else. So you need even higher standards. Uh, it's it's a very good idea of not thinking of it to, to construct a more um, structural and, and, and a more complex image conceptually. But, but you also have to take into consideration the fact that those technologies can be misused by somebody else, by somebody who's, who you're not expecting to be misused by, and, and that's also a problem. And lastly, um, I was thinking of, of how to move forward and whether our fight is a fight of taking this down. And uh, I think that's not necessarily the case. I, I think I, we wouldn't disagree on the fact that we all uh, for better security. I, I think that's generally, I mean, not debatable. Uh, but the thing is, do these systems work? Do, do, they, do they actually do the, the, the job they're supposed to do? And I think we're saying they don't. So uh, let's get on the same page, let's all move in the same direction and try and achieve 
actual security through measures that work and that don't imply human rights violations. <laughs> that simple. Thank you so much, Juan. I think that was a good uh, wrap up to a lot of the, the discussions that we've been having uh, today, spanning from issues of transparency to issues of sovereignty, to issue of lack of regulatory frameworks. And more than anything, I think that the main idea or the main purpose of this panel was to really see what other people is doing and what other people could potentially offer in a, a space where we can exchange information more than anything and get to a common ground in order to actually evaluate what Juan is saying. Like, are these really, are, are really this system that effective? I mean, should the state really acquire them and, um, exp and ex spend a huge amount of money, uh, even though, of course, security has no price? But I think that there are so many methodologies and processes in, in place. And I think one you mentioned that hasn't been necessarily tackled here is the issue of risk assessment that countries, for instance, like the US or the UK do in order to acquire certain technologies and that we don't necessarily in our context uh, apply in the same way. Um, so I think we're at the midst of this debate that is at the peak of, of, of its relevance. And I think that aside from the resistance strategies that we from civil society are indeed doing in different ways, like talking from the strategic litigation that uh, Edu was mentioning or from the uh, research that all our organizations are doing and are of course, dealing with difficulties when, 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 when accessing the information, but still finding its ways uh, to get to what we need to get, we still need more collaboration. And we still need to move forward also to a space where different actors can indeed convene in a meaningful and effective way, not just convene for the sake of, and jointly address these topics. So I think we can wrap up uh, now. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time. Thank you very much for everyone uh, attending online. Thank you so much to our technical team. Uh, we really appreciate that everything works smoothly. Because uh, <laughs> I was very scared of that. Uh, <laughs> so thank you. Uh, I hope we continue this conversation over coffee. Thank you so much.